You're listening to the Best Morning Routine Ever podcast, the show that proves no one stumbles upon success ever. With your host, Lou Need. Every Mondays and Thursdays, we deliver cold heart evidence behind the power of a robust morning routine. Get ready to be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Hello, morning enthusiasts. Welcome to the Best Morning Routine Ever podcast. I am your host, Lunid Lewis. And today I have the privilege of introducing a very special guest to the show, Glenn Livingston. Glenn, PhD, is a veteran psychologist and was the longtime CEO of a multi-million dollar consulting firm, which has serviced several Fortune 500 clients in the food industry. Disillusioned by what traditional psychology had to offer overweight and or food obsessed individuals, Dr. Livingston spent several decades researching the nature of binging and overeating via work with his own patients and a self-funded research program with more than 40,000 participants. <laughs> Most importantly, however, was his own personal journey out of ob- obesity and food poisoning to a normal, healthy weight and a much more lighthearted relationship with food. Glenn, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Lenid. I've been looking forward to this all week. It is a delight. It, I can't wait to delve into it because I'm an emotional eater. So I'm hoping by the end of this 20 minutes, I will be cured. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll get you on the way. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your background. I know you struggled with obesity growing up as well. And now um, it's really a life mission for you because you were just telling me you're about to do a TEDx talk on it with Kaiser and, and, and how obesity, how we can tackle obesity. Tell us about your background and what led you here. Well, I, I was invited to apply. I don't know if I'm going to do it yet, but I talk about it all over the place. And I, you know, I was a, um, I was a binge eater slash ex- exercise bulimic from the time that I was a boy. I'm six four, reasonably muscular, and when I was about seventeen, I figured out that if I worked out for two or three hours a day, that I didn't have to worry about what I ate. Mm-hmm. And boy, could I eat! If you if you stopped at a 7-Eleven and they didn't have any more pizza or Pop-Tarts, it's probably because I was there before you. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. And that lifestyle worked out really well for me. Work out a lot, eat a lot. Until I was about 22 and I was married and in graduate school and I, you know, I just didn't have the time. I was commuting two hours a day. I was running a business and I couldn't work out for two or three hours a day. And I found that the food obsession was still with me. So I couldn't stop eating. It had a life of its own. And I got fatter and fatter and it upset me. And, you know, being a psychologist from a family of 17 therapists, I, I really believed that I had an emotional eating problem. And, you know, if you got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so I went to the best psychologists and psychiatrists and Overeaters Anonymous. And I went on this very soulful journey for a very long time. And I, they, I could characterize it by saying, I thought that the, if I could find out how to heal the hole in my heart, then I could stop overeating, then I wouldn't have to fill the hole in my stomach. Right. And I learned an awful lot about myself during that time it was very spiritual in many ways. It turned me into a different kind of person, which I'm proud of. And what I didn't realize, though, was that it didn't really help me with the overeating itself. I would get a little better and a lot worse and a little better and a lot worse. And I and I ballooned up to about 280 pounds at one point. I, I stopped weighing myself, so I don't know the exact number. And the doctors were yelling at me about my triglycerides. They were well over 1,000. And they told me I was going to die by the time I was 35 if I kept at this. And um, and I couldn't stop. And even worse yet was that I would be sitting with high risk clients, like suicidal clients or clients right after an affair. And being a psychologist was the most important thing in the world to me. But I'd be sitting with these people and I'd be thinking, well, when can I get some pop tarts? <laughs> um, and, and so it really bothered me. <sighs> Eventually I came to a different paradigm. And I'll tell you up front, the result was that rather than trying to heal the hole in my heart and loving myself thin, I changed my mind and decided I had to be more like an alpha wolf 
challenging, uh, keeping a challenger for leadership in the pack in line. And, and, you know, when an alpha wolf is challenged for leadership, it doesn't say, oh, my goodness, someone needs a hug. It says, get back in line and I'll kill you or I'll kill you, right? Yes. Yeah. And it growls and it snarls and it takes charge. And there were three things that really led me to that conclusion. They're all important. One is that when I started to study neurology a little bit more, and I'm, you know, I'm not a neurologist, I'm not a medical doctor, I know enough to be dangerous. But when I started to study it, what I found out was that the part of the brain that responds to food addiction doesn't know love. You're talking about the reptilian brain. And when the reptilian brain, the seat of feast and famine, the seat of um, survival drives, fight or flight, that kind of thing, the reptilian brain sees something in the environment that it says, do I eat it? Do oh. I mate with it? Or do I kill it? Mm -hmm. Right? It's all eat, mate, or kill. There's no love there. And so I thought, well, that's really interesting. I'm trying to love myself thin, but this might not have anything to do with love. And then I, I was doing some consulting for, um, for the advertising and food industries. And I'm kind of embarrassed that I did this. I feel like I was on the wrong side of the war. But I saw that they were spending billions of dollars to engineer these hyper palatable substances, you know, like food like substances that were concentrations of starch and sugar and fat and oil and salt and excitotoxins that were aimed at hitting our bliss point without giving us enough nutrition to feel satisfied. And, you know, that's, that's addiction defined, right? Mm -hmm. And, and then the advertising industry was so good at making us feel like we couldn't survive without them. Do you know, I remember I was doing an advertising group for um, a major food bar manufacturer and the VB took me aside, VP took me aside and said, you know, Glenn, the most profitable thing we ever did was take the vitamins out of the bar and put them into the, put the money into the packaging instead to make it look healthy. And I said, so you mean you're faking us out? And he kind of looked ashamed and he said, yeah. Um, and, and that's perfectly legal and it goes on all over the industry. So they're overstimulating the reptilian brain. There's not enough nutrition to make you feel satisfied. And then they're faking you out with this colorful, vibrant packaging. And in nature, a diversity of vibrant colors would represent the availability of a diversity of micronutrients. Um, but that's not really what's happening here. They're, they're leveraging an evolutionary phenomenon, the attraction to a diversity of colors, which is intended to get us a diversity of nutrients, but they're not giving it to us. And so I said, wow, these are very powerful forces. And this has nothing to do with the fact that my mama didn't love me enough and fed me chocolate instead of... Um, you know, instead of breakfast, you can, you became addicted to these things. Yeah. Yeah. And at a certain point it has nothing, it doesn't really even matter what the match was that struck the fire. What, what matter it matters is how do you be a good fire person and, and how do you contain a fire in a fireplace in the first place? Yeah. So I think of the emotion like a roaring fire in a fireplace. Well, if you have a really good fireplace, you can have a roaring fire. There's nothing wrong with it. And it becomes the center of hearth and home. People gather around it and they make memories and they talk and they laugh and they cry. And it's not dangerous at all if the fireplace contains it and doesn't, doesn't let the ashes escape. But if there are holes in the fireplace, then even one ash can burn the house down. And what really drove this home for me was eventually... I interviewed my mom I, after that 40,000 person study where I figured out that people who struggle with chocolate tend to be uh, depressed or lonely or brokenhearted. And I always started my binges with chocolate. I called my mom and I said, mom, why would I be depressed or lonely and brokenhearted and go rent a chocolate? I mean, I, I was in a bad marriage and you know, I wasn't divorced yet. And um, so obviously I had some loneliness and brokenheartedness, but why was I running to chocolate? What was the pattern? And I said, mom, how did this get set up? And she says, I'm so embarrassed. And I said, mom, t tell me what, what happened. It's, it's okay. I forgive you. It's 40 years later, but what happened? And apparently when I was one year old in 1965, they were talking about sending my dad to Vietnam. He was a captain in the army and we only had one, they only had one kid and they were sent, talking about sending him to, to Vietnam and she was terrified because she was trying to have another kid. She thought she was going to be an army widow with two small kids. And at the same time, my grandfather, her dad, had just gotten out of prison. And she didn't know that he was guilty. And she'd idolized him her whole life. 
and she was devastated. She just felt like um, her whole world fell apart. And so when I came running to her for love or food or to be played with, she didn't always have the wherewithal to do it because she was sitting and staring at the wall feeling anxious and depressed herself. And she kept a bottle of chocolate Bosco and a refrigerator on the floor. And she said, Glenn, go get your Bosco. And I go running over to the to the little refrigerator, crawling over, I guess. And I take the Bosco out and I suck on the on the bottle and I go into a chocolate sugar coma. And you would think that that insight would cure me, right? So that there it is in black and white. That's exactly what happened. That's why I'm messed up with chocolate and love. That's why I have it all confused in my head. And you would think that if this were a movie, mom and I would have a big cry and a big hug and we'd forgive each other and we'd just you know, go on with our days and I'd never have chocolate again, right? Um, what actually happened, Lunid, is that I got worse. And the reason I got worse was that there was this crazy voice inside of me. And that voice went something like this. You know what, Glenn? You're right. Our mama didn't love us enough and she left a great big chocolate-sized hole in your heart. And until you can find the love of your life and get out of this marriage, you're going to have to go right on binging on chocolate. Yippee, let's go do it right now. And I started binging more on chocolate because I had that voice of justification. When I put it all together, I said, well, okay. So there's the advertising industry. There's the big food industry. These are external forces. The brain is set up so that the there's this, uh, it's kind of like an organ in the brain, the lower brain that activates these survival drives. And the survival drives have really been stolen by industry. But I know that the neocortex, the part of us that really values you know, long-term goals and who we are as a person and developing character and the part of us that you know, says, wait a minute, before you eat, mate, or kill that thing, what impact does that have on the people that you love? I know that that's in control. I know that we can direct the impulses of the lower brain with that, you know, upper advisor. And this is embarrassing and I wasn't going to publish it, but I decided that I was going to have to take control of that thing. So I called it, I called it my inner pig. I was just going to keep a journal. I wasn't going to tell anybody about this. I called it my inner pig and I would draw a very clear line in the sand. Like I, I will never have chocolate on a weekday again. And if I heard a little voice in my head that said, you worked out hard enough or you could start tomorrow on a Wednesday, I would say, that's not me. That's my inner pig. My pig is squealing for pig slop. I don't want pig slop. And I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. And as ridiculous as that sounds, it would wake me up at the moment of impulse and give me a few extra microseconds to remember who I was and make the right decision. And it, it wasn't a miracle. Like there was a year or so when I was playing with certain rules and it took a while before I was really following them. But that's what did the trick for me. That's how I got control of things. And um, long story how I wound up publishing it. But now we have almost a million copies in distribution. And people recognize me, but they don't know my name. They just, they just point at me and go, pig guy. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's my story. I tried to make it quick, but that's my story. <laughs> that has a sense of humor to it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love the um the breakdown you did with the science, the neurology piece of it. Looking at the what you call the lower brain, right? Yeah, and how and how um it's it's a it's on survival mode, and and how that that lower part of the brain doesn't recognize love, but using that upper brain. I, and I and I'm a big sucker for science, so I would love for you to to um break down how do we. Um, tap into the upper advisor, right? That upper brain. What are some mm. guides, some steps to start? Mm. We can completely stop eating, bench eating. Okay. I'm, I might not do this justice. Do you remember whether it's the parasympathetic or the sympathetic nervous system that revs us up? I think it's the parasympathetic that revs up, us up and the sympathetic calms us down. I don't remember. Well, okay. I don't remember at the moment either. And I, I really should because I get asked that question sometimes. But the bottom line is that there are two parts of the nervous system. There's a part that is responsible for fight or flight, feast or famine, emergency response, saying we better do something about this right now and leap into action. That's the part that makes you feel like just hand over the chocolate and nobody gets hurt. <laughs> the other part of our nervous system is responsible for 
rest and digestion, for relaxation, for um, calming us down and you know putting us into a, a state of mind where we can connect with other people and be very present and mindful and that kind of thing. And so what you really want to do is, first of all, have a clear line so you can recognize when there's some thought in your head that suggests that you're going to do something you don't really want to do. Um, and that's why it was important to say, I'll never eat chocolate on a weekday again. And I don't preach what anybody's rules should be. They make their own diets up. But you need a very clear line so that you can hear the voice in your head that says that you should cross the line. When you hear the voice in your head that says you should cross the line, you're probably experiencing some activation, at least some activation of that reptilian brain. And so what you want to do first is just take three deep breaths and just try to reattach to your mindfulness and presence and let the, let the body take you out of that fight or flight, feast or famine mechanism. And then if you can carry around a little pen and paper or use your smartphone, something you can take notes on, you want to ask yourself, why is the reptilian brain telling me I should eat this now? And so an example might be the reptilian brain says I should get that chocolate bar at Starbucks because I worked out hard enough today. It won't really make a difference and I can just as easily start tomorrow. And then you ask yourself after another deep breath, why is that wrong? How is, how is the pig lying to me in other words? And in that case, it's not correct that it's just as easy to start tomorrow. The principles of neuroplasticity, which is how we learn, suggest that what fires together wires together, which means that if you have an urge and you indulge it today, you've dug a deeper groove in that habit in, in your brain and you're more likely to do it tomorrow. It's going to be harder to resist tomorrow. The best time to stop is right now. You can always use the present moment to be healthy. So that would be an example of refuting what the pig was saying and, and reminding yourself that, um, you know, that it's not true and you don't have to listen to it. The other reason that works is because writing is an upper brain activity. It's a kind of a logical controlled um, way, way of reasoning, whereas binging is uh, more activated by the feast and famine, you know, survival drive in the reptilian brain. And then you take another deep breath and you say, what kind of person will I become if I stop doing this? If I stop listening to the pig and I stop having chocolate on impulse, maybe I want to plan it out for the weekend or something. But if I stop doing it on impulse and I become someone who controls my, my chocolate impulses, what kind of person will I become? And what's that going to do for me in a couple of years? And at some point you want to sit down and think about, all the things that will improve in your life if you uh, stop indulging in these behaviors you know that aren't really working for you and you take control of them and define them and regulate them instead. I call that the big why. And so the whole process takes you out of the emergency mode, puts you into a more logical reasoned mode. It helps you to... Um, Remember why the voice of justification that's been fooling you all these years is really wrong after you can actually hear it in the first place. And then it reminds you of the kind of person you want to become with this food. See, if you ask people, could you give up chocolate forever? Almost everybody says no. If you ask them, could you become the kind of person who doesn't eat chocolate? A lot of people scratch their head and they say, maybe. So th that's the very practical way and i tried to include some science to scratch your science itch yeah along with that. yeah so the sympathetic um nervous system as it, it it's the um fight or flight it's okay the, it's the para that is the, the rest and digest thank you mm -hmm. now if i wind up going and ted it won't look like an idiot <laughs> <laughs> the goal is to go from sympathetic to power yes yeah the goal is to go from the sense of emergency action which says you know, this is a matter of survival. Everyone in my body thinks that, you know, feels like I have to do this. Remind yourself that feelings aren't facts and to get back into your um, 
get back into your head, breathe, be in your body, and remember why you wanted to do this. What kind of person are you trying to become? Yeah, feelings are not facts. Well feelings put. Are in facts. <laughs> They're not yeah. facts, absolutely. And de- feelings are usually the um, um, triggers. Um, there's there's usually triggers that ca- that that leads to binge eating. What are some of them that you've you've seen in your field? Oh well, well so the just so that people really understand how it works, the feelings don't cause the binge; they cause a desire to binge. They they trigger a desire to binge, and then there's that voice of justification that makes it okay. Um, it's important that people understand there's that intervening voice because that's what gives you the lever to stop the emotions from becoming a binge. But most commonly, what types of emotions make people want to binge? Um, Probably a sense of abandonment or or rejection is one of the biggest deals. If they're trying to connect to a person, this is more for women than men, but it happens for men too. If they're trying to connect to a romantic partner or they're looking to be approved of by their boss, or they want to be, have a sense of belonging and be accepted by their friends. And then something happens, a guy doesn't like them or the friend says something mean or something. And there's this icky feeling inside. It's almost like they've been ostracized from the tribe. And there's a primitive response that says their survival is at stake. And then many people feel driven to binge from that. Turns out in the study that I did, People that are stressed at home tend to binge on um, on like chewy, starchy things like bread and bagels and pasta. And people who are stressed at work, they tend to binge on crunchy, salty things like, like to get that oral aggression out, like you know pretzels and chips and stuff like that. So that's interesting. the The pasta and the bread and the chewy stuff were the worst. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. The abdominal area will we respond immediately. Oh yeah, I, I like and to I, I like to say I retain ice cream, and so I try not <laughs> to have any of it. <laughs> Another time when we have time, I can um I can coach you through that. <laughs> that would be great. I mean, it sounds like you have a, a tremendous breakthroughs with the people you've worked with because you have the science to actually tackle um what what's happening with the brain. That's what's missing with a lot of. Um, coaching without, without a lot of the diet fad, with a lot of um, this talk about obs- obesity, and it's happening with our kids too, you know. So, for you, what makes you very unique, um, Glenn, is that you have the science to back it up, and you have the research to back it up. Well, you know, the the other thing is that overeaters and bingers tend to also be good dieters, so they're living in the feast and famine cycle. And I I believe there's an evolutionary mechanism that says if we live in an environment, if we find ourselves in an environment where calories and nutrition are too scarce for a period of time, then as soon as it's available, we have to hoard it. And that's why, for example, being too full is such a trigger for some people to overeat. Because if you think about it, it doesn't make sense in any other perspective. It's got to be signaling the brain, okay, the, the famine is over. Now it's time to go. Let's take as much as we can. So I try to get people not to try to lose weight too quickly. I try to rid them of the diet mentality, try to ask them to think about the kind of person they want to be with food instead, and you know, to work with a nutritionist or a dietitian or at least one of the online calculators so that they know that they're not trying to go at a pace of more than a pound or two per week. Um, I, people come to me and they want to do these $500, 500, um, out, 500 calorie diets, <laughs> and I just almost always find that those bounce back the other way. So people, they're really taken with them. It's hard to talk them out of it, but the, this, the path out of binge eating is not restriction. The path out of binge eating is regular, reliable nutrition at a small caloric deficit to accomplish the weight loss goal. Yeah. Adding nutrition back into the body, eating healthier and of course, um, exercising, right? Yeah. When you move, you learn that just you said your neurons that, um, that wire together. <laughs> If you're moving, you're learning. When they they fire together, they wire together. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Tell us, um, Glenn, what's your morning routine like? How do you get up, dress up, and show up? Oh, I love that phrase. Say it again. How do I get up, dress up, and show up? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, 
Is that, is that your moniker? I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's my motto. Everyone gets that question. Get up, dress up, and show up. I love it. Okay. So I have a rule for myself, actually. I'm a Never Binge Again rule that says I may not do anything in the morning besides go to the bathroom before I make my food for the day. And what that looks like for me, typically, I've got a juicer and a Vitamix and my refrigerator, if I showed you a picture, is entirely full of greens and fruit. And I make a giant green smoothie that's going to take me all the way through dinner. And that way I don't have to think about it. I, you know, I work at home so I can just kind of drink while I'm talking to people or you know, between sessions sometimes. And, and I, I sit and stare at the ocean while I do that. So that's the first thing that I do. Then I go to the computer and I turn on my, um, my Microsoft Word and I open my journal. And I ask myself if there's anything I'm feeling anxious or depressed about. And I write out what that is. I ask myself if there were only one thing that I accomplished today, what would the biggest win be? Because like every entrepreneur, I find that I've got a long list of things that I could do many more than I ever will be able to do. And I can never get them all done. It's just a matter of organizing and executing it in a matter of priority. And knowing what the single biggest win for that one day is going to be makes all the difference in the world. When I'm done with that, I usually do some kind of exercise. I, uh, I do a combination of um, hot yoga and aerobics and a little bit of weightlifting. And, and I like the classes, so I'm usually going to one of the early morning classes. Then I come home. I, Like I said, I live on the beach. I usually go jump in the ocean or the pool or spend 10 or 15 minutes outside, get a little bit of sun, some fresh air. And I come upstairs, I take a shower, and I get my butt to work. Have I seen you in Brickham Yoga? <laughs> you might have. <laughs> Do you live in San Diego? <laughs> no, no, I, oh, I love San Diego. I love San Diego, though. <laughs> you said hot yoga. Man, I love that yoga. I did it for three years. And that was a great way to detox the body. Oh, my God. Oh, I still feel so much better afterwards. And I usually drink a gallon of water, gallon of water when I'm there. I live in Pompano Beach, Florida. Ah, okay. Yeah, you still got the sun. Yeah, yeah. You still got the nice weather. I do most of the time. The morning routine um, speaks volume. Um, I love the notion of not doing anything um, immediately upon rising or checking anything. It's that that time to yourself. It's it's so important. Uh, you know, when I do it right, the rest of the day goes so much better. Oh yeah. When I, I do it wrong, it's hard to get into flow. I I can attest to that as well. Even if it's um if it's just moment of silence. Um, or meditation or just observing your breath in and out that like that really sets the tone for the rest of the day. Because if you start, it's chaotic, then the day will follow that, that trend. Psychologists, exactly. your psychologists, are psychologists and doctors. That's what they say. First, what you do in the first eight minutes, set the tone. Means everything. It does. Yeah. And then you're journaling and, and visualizing and then planning out what your, 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 what you said your wins are, right? What you're going to work on. Cause you can't do it all. We try to. Do, do you talk to everybody about their morning routine in every every episode? I do. I, I want to go back and listen to all your episodes now. <laughs> it stands true. Yours, um, I have been compiling data and interviewing hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs and finding the commonalities, the things that you, keep coming up. Do you have a summary someplace or a class that you sell? I have an app. Okay. <laughs> I develop, I'm developing an app that is coming out in three weeks. It's called Hit. Oh, what's it going to be called? Hit Savers. Each um, letter stands for a habit. I can't wait to see this. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty fantastic. I got a revision today and I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. I'm doing beta testing next week. I start next week. A hundred people is going to be selected and they get it for you, a lifetime. That's fantastic. We're developing an app also, so we should talk. But yes. okay, well, well no, I, I want to see your app, and I think everybody else should take a look at the app also. Oh, absolutely! Um, great. Yeah, and um, you know, exercising and then Brickham Yoga. I mean, it's just wonderful what that what that does to the body. You, you helps lose weight too, so much, so quick. Yeah. That yeah, a lot of people don't don't um, can't. They say they can't survive it or withstand it, but if you can stand there for 90 minutes, then you can do anything else. It helps you being uncomf being get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Well, then you could just stay in the room. You, you don't have to do the whole exercise. That's what I did at first. I would just lie down on the mat if I was dizzy or I couldn't do it. Um, and it got easier over time. Yeah, you build that, that momentum. You build that stamina, that re resiliency. That's with everything, right, Glenn? That's with everything in life. Like you, At first, you're going to suck at it, but you got to keep at it to improve. Exactly. To improve. Exactly. Um, Glenn, how can we connect with you? 
Well, I, I've got a whole bunch of free things at my website I think people would like, including a free copy of the book. Um, NeverBingeAgain.com, click the big red button and sign up for the reader bonuses. You'll get a copy of the book in Kindle, Nook, or PDF format, along with a free set of um, food plan starter templates. So whatever dietary philosophy you have, there's a set of rules that you can evaluate and adjust to meet your own needs. And I recorded a whole bunch of coaching sessions because I know this sounds really weird and um, I wanted you to be able to to, to see what it's about in, in real life. So neverbingeagain.com, click the big red button. Yeah. And I will put that on the show notes so um, my listeners can connect with you. Um, just a brief recap. Um, you talked about the ways to uh, some guides to help you to um, stop with bench eating. And you mentioned number one is taking three deep breath. It's just calming the mind down. And number two is getting a pen and paper and writing down um, what, writing down some notes. What, what are some triggers? Why do you want to eat this and identifying what the triggers are so you can, um, uh, so you, you can know what to do, how to deal with them. And then the last one, you said, what kind of person would I be if I did this? And so exactly. I, I thank you so much for coming in and adding so much value today. Thank you so much, Lita. Thank you, dear. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, all right, morning enthusiasts. That's it for today's show. Thank you for tuning in. If you love the best morning routine ever podcast, we'd love to hear from you. So go ahead and subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes or Google Play. While you're at it, tell a friend about the show. Be sure to visit bestmorningroutineever.com and our Facebook group to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our fantastic free bonus content. Until next time.